It's the best of the theologians on deck for the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. Welcome to the podcast of the Ministry of Motion Pictures, where we seek to inspire Christian filmmakers, ignite a Christian film movement, and impact the new media landscape. I'm writer and director Todd Schaefer and your host. As this podcast approaches the 50th episode, I thought it might be interesting to create an episode of highlights, some of the best moments that we've had in the past few years. The guests who were the most surprising, most unexpected, and who had the greatest impact, at least on me, were the theologians. I expected these scholars and churchmen to have some pushback on the Christian film movement, even the ones who seemed to have a clear affinity for the arts. Because we live in a culture drowning in entertainment, amusing ourselves to death, as Neil Postman puts it, surely these men must have some cautions and concerns for us. But what they gave us was a clear picture of the why Christian films are important, and the what's of what Christian films should be. They painted a very noble view of the importance of good Christian filmmaking. These three men helped to frame a strategy and glorious purpose for Christian filmmakers. I met Dr. Mark Coppinger when I visited the Franklin branch of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Mark was helping me to form an advisory board for my studio, Glorious Films, and he's become a good friend. Dr. Coppinger was a professor of Christian philosophy and ethics at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he supervised, and this is where it gets interesting, he supervised a graduate program called Christianity and the Arts. And within that program, Mark was responsible for a track called Aesthetic Theology. So Mark has spent a significant part of his career thinking about the relationship between theology and aesthetics, and he even wrote a book called The Skeptic's Guide to Arts in the Church. Dr. Kevin Van Hooser wrote a book called Pictures at a Theological Exhibition. This title intrigued me and I bought it, but it sat on my shelf for some time until I had to fly to a shoot for a commercial I was directing, and I threw this book in my bag to read on the plane. I couldn't put the book down. In fact, I couldn't even get out of the first chapter. I had to read it, reread it, underline it, and then write out what was engaging me in this book. When I told this to Dr. Van Hooser, he took it as a critique, thinking that he had not written it well enough, but that wasn't the case at all. What his book expressed were ideas that were so new to me I had to wrestle with them to try to apply those lessons to being a Christian filmmaker. It was like water for a parched filmmaker's soul, and I knew I had to get him on the podcast to engage with him on these issues. Dr. Van Hooser is a very prolific author, and he's a research professor of systematic theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I knew Dr. Coppinger and Dr. Van Hooser both had an affinity for the arts, but I wasn't sure where the men at Nine Marks Ministries stood. I've listened to almost every podcast that Nine Marks has produced, and I wanted to know what they thought about Christian film, so I reached out to them, and the editorial director, Dr. Jonathan Lehman, accepted my invitation. And Jonathan did not disappoint. He gave me a lot to think about, and he introduced me to the brilliant concept of a right moral ecology in Christian filmmaking. While he's an editorial director, pastor, and author of a number of books, He's also an adjunct professor for Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Reformed Theological Seminary. So there you have it, three theologians who believe that there is a very important role that Christian filmmakers can play in the life of the church. And in Dr. Van Hooser's words, Christian filmmakers can be allies to the work of pastors and teachers and theologians in the church. Their best moments are here in episode 48. We begin with Dr. Mark Coppinger talking about why aesthetics, the arts, and film are important for Christians. Well, I mean, God has given us these sensitivities, and I think just as we need to be stewards of our physical life and exercise, nutrition, stewards of our rational life and careful thinking, we do have these... Uh, appetites. Uh, I mean, this is a funny way to put it, but when you when you don't honor aesthetics, like in composing and delivering a sermon or in, uh, you know, some kind of writing a book or whatever, ever, then you fall into boredom. I mean, make a film. It's just, it's boring. You, you, you check your watch out. You're, uh, you know, somebody, I said once, somebody crammed a 15 minute sermon into 45 minutes. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's seasoning in life. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it gives, it gives punch to whatever you're trying to, 
whatever you're trying to persuade someone of. Or, or it's it's just a, a wonderful way to unstring the bow that, uh, you know, we're we're just grinding and grinding. I mean, I have to give Schopenhauer a little credit, and there's a lot of grind to life. And he just says it's a it's just really a kind of a, a tiring, exhausting, vexing uh, kind of world we live in. And I think he got the answer wrong, but he said that in the arts and music and painting and so forth, we can't, we have a kind of rest. And I've even found this, like when I travel someplace and I'll be in a series of meetings or, uh, you know, wrestling, trying to find a good place to eat or get a cab or something. If I can go into an art museum and just walk around and just sit and look at some paintings and browse the bookstore, it's, it's a real refreshment. And I think that uh, one of the wonderful things about about the arts, and of course with film, that they're just they're they're just wonderful ways. I, I don't want to use the word escape, but there is a, the kind of escape to it. Um, I, the other night, I took my grandkids. My son and his wife were uh, out on an anniversary, and I took my grandkids to see uh, how to how to train your dragon, and it was in three D, the first three D movie they'd been to, and I wasn't thinking all the way through like I can use this in lectures, you know, and this will. Uh, you know, this will make me a more incisive uh, column writer, and and uh, it'll bake bread and make shoes and so forth. It, it's just kicking back with my grandkids, and and I ended up crying at the end. I mean, come on, you know, here here I'm a, a grown man. <laughs> so, how should we see aesthetics play out in the church? One thing I will mention this kind of I think it's it's important and it's playing right now. There's um, a push to be really taken with what's called the transcendentals. Uh, you know, it's like truth, goodness, and beauty. And um, we're all for truth, and we're all for goodness, and we're all for beauty. But, you know, aesthetics is a lot more than beauty. A lot of people think, oh, well, that's about beauty. But no, I mean, it, 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 something may be magnificently ugly. Um, something may be uh, very disturbing and, and, and yet be so well crafted that it's an aesthetic success. So that's that's a little hitch I have right now about what some some of the people in church are talking about, that they think that the whole topic of aesthetics is beauty, and it's more than that. The better the crafting, the, the more aesthetically laudable it is. I mean, one yeah, can yeah. drone on and on for an hour in a monotone, and, you know, you told the story, but, uh, you know, people are, are drooling, and their eyes are heavy, and they're falling out of the in, down in the pew or something. So the aesthetic craftsman is one and by the way the thing that's so maddening is that some of the very best folks in aesthetics are are godless or sub-christian or anti-christian and so you'll you'll see a movie or uh uh you know an ad and and you just think oh i hate it that it's so good you know uh yeah, yeah. The, the, the the script writing or we were we were just when we were flipping channels tonight at supper and uh happened to be uh packing i'm going to louisville my wife's going to visit her mom and uh, anyway, we were watching a little bit of, um, oh, the one about, uh, Do I think it's called Dodgeball with Vince Vaughn and some of those folks. And, and they're just terrible people, uh, deplorable people. But some of the humor and some of the pacing in that is so good that you think, wow, why, you know, why couldn't somebody <laughs> nail that when it comes to the it comes to a Christian message? I mean, I think of particular movies that... Um, that just just stunned me. Um, I mean, one even way back in college was The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Uh, had Alan Arkin in it, and it was about a you know an unappreciated deaf man who cared for all these other people. And and I I, I just I don't know. I think I, on a scale of one to ten, my sensitivity to hurting people like went from who knows from a four to a seven or something. That I mean, it was just a, quite amazing. And I could just go through so many films that. Uh, that blessed me or shocked me or instructed, you know, instructed me. And, and by the way, I don't think we need to worry about being preachy because, and we get so skittish about that, but you know, Michael Moore, he is, he is so preachy. Um, uh, Oliver Stone, so preachy. Uh, the guys who made, again, Brokeback Mountain or Girls Don't Cry, you know, uh, with Hillary Swank and other they are preaching, preaching, lay it on, laying it on so heavy. Um, and so I don't think we need to say heavy message is, you know, is, is our mistake. But if we could be truth people where we don't put out bogus notions, crazy conspiracies, we don't, 
you know, we, we have people dress and speak the way they really do. We show warts, but we show glory. Um, I think that could be very compelling. Dr. Kevin Van Hooser is up next talking about how biblical theology is not intended to serve scholarship or give preachers something to talk about. A good biblical theology must be played out in the drama of our everyday lives. And it's the drama that's created when life and theology come together. That's what gives us our stories to tell. Yeah, well, let me just say I very much appreciate the fact that you're taking this aspect of your work, the theological aspect, so seriously. And I think we're all witnesses, right, in our various vocations. And what I appreciate about you is I just don't know many filmmakers who see their vocation as, you know, tied up with their discipleship. So it's very exciting to me to think that you have this Ministry of Motion Pictures group beginning to talk about these things. As as you'll see as our conversation progresses, I think filmmakers are are crucial, uh, what do we call it, cultural creatives. You know, you have a crucial role to play. Well, that's great to hear. I'm I'm, uh, I'm excited to hear you say that. (laughs) So as we jump in, just give me a summary of your concept of the drama of doctrine and faith speaking and understanding. Right. So I'm a, a Christian theologian who teaches pastors at a seminary. So you may be wondering what I'm doing on this program. But uh, the simple answer is, I have a healthy view and respect for the imagination. My students, I sometimes fear, are taking my theology classes because they have to. They're required. They don't always see the relevance of Christian doctrine for the Christian life. And so that was my challenge early on as a seminary professor. I had to explain how doctrine is not simply a dry and dusty you know, set of truths that have nothing to do with real life, but something more exciting. So I hit upon the idea that uh, the Christian life is a kind of participation in God's drama, because the gospel isn't a system of ideas. It's about what God has done in history, and we're involved in that. So I suggest to my students that doctrine gives us understanding of the drama of which we are a part, and of how to understand our roles as disciples and how to fit into the ongoing action because the Christian walk, the Christian life, the Christian drama continues. And so the question for the disciple simply is, how do I play my part on this part of the stage, the world stage, at this time? That's a hard question. What does Christianity look like in the 21st century in my neck of the woods? And so I'm suggesting that doctrine isn't simply something systematic that's universally true for all times. I mean, it it does have truth, but the drama of doctrine is the exciting project of trying to figure out how the truths of Christianity direct my living here and now. And that's the drama. So in this, in this display, um, what is the role of the imagination for Christians? How does that work itself out? So again, I'm a theologian, and some people think I might not have any business you know, talking about the imagination. But I think it's crucial because you can have a church full of people who will sign on the dotted line of their confession of faith. But in their heart of hearts and in their daily life, they may be caught up in a very different story. That is, they they may know what they're supposed to believe as Christians, but what actually governs the way they live is some other story. And I think that even in our churches, the imaginations of our congregations has been taken captive by other stories, other pictures of the good life, other images that are attractive and very powerful in our culture. And so there's a disconnect. Uh, It's one thing to have the right doctrine, another thing to live by it. My concern is that people, in a sense, profess the right doctrine, but they're living by doctrines that actually are tied up with different stories. That's because their imaginations have been uh, 
I'll say captured, by some other account of the good news than the gospel. And so we're living according to this imagination that we've developed. I think the imagination is really, you know, gives us the story we live by. I actually think that if you, if you think of the brain as a computer, uh, the actual physical brain as the hardware, you can think of the stories we live by as the software, the program that kind of runs our lives. And I would associate the imagination with the software, with the program that's sort of running our lives. What story are we acting out? What's the program? What's the software that makes us go? Also at the C.S. Lewis uh, conference in the Q&A section, you, you raised up a point about the danger of the imagination um, needing to not being disciplined by the Word of God. Could you? Oh, sure. So... It's interesting and makes my project a little more complicated that the King James Version of the Bible, every time it uses the English word imagination, it almost always prefaces it by the word vain. <laughs> as if, as if to imagine is to get your mind going on a vain enterprise. You know, it's wasting your time. You know, uh, not a good use of your mental resources. Uh, the problem, so there's two things here. First of all, I do acknowledge that the imagination can picture things that aren't there. That's a kind of standard view of the imagination. We form a mental picture of something that's not real or something that's not there. We can imagine a moon made of green cheese. Uh, nothing particularly virtuous about that. And I think, you know, at the limit, our false images become idols. We can imagine a piece of wood as a god, and so we can begin praying to it and so on. Well, that, that is a vain imagining. But, and this is a key point, I think, uh, every part of human being has fallen. Our reasoning, you know, can lead us astray. We can rationalize bad forms of behavior and also... Uh, our reason is sometimes fallacious, right? We can, we can fall into logical fallacies. So, but just because reason has a pathology doesn't mean we should abandon it. And so, similarly, just because the imagination has a pathology, it doesn't mean we should abandon it. I actually think the imagination is a, a kind of higher function of our minds and Unlike reason that analyzes things by taking them apart, the amazing thing about imagination is that it sees things together. It, it's the power of associating things that we don't necessarily see with our physical eyes together. Interesting. Yeah, and that's what Jesus does again in his parables. He associates the kingdom of God with something earthly. That's, that's a work of imagination. Right. He's so assim he's assimilating all these things together for us to understand and then live by them, which is what yeah, yes. And so the imagination, when disciplined by scriptural truths, is a very powerful way of making sense of the world. Even scientists like Einstein have to use imagination when they try to think a hypothesis up, and. Again, what we have in Scripture is not simply a hypothesis. It's, it's the true story of the world, but it's so big, we need our imagination to grasp how Genesis and Revelation fit together. How does the beginning and the end fit? We need a, only the imagination can kind of see the end and the beginning, and here again, the beginning and the end. But there are lots of connections between the beginning and the end of the Bible, and in between... There are lots of symbols and images that remind us of the big picture. How can f Christian filmmakers um, use this teaching uh, to create their, their films for Christian audiences, for worldly audiences? Yeah, well, so I'm not a specialist in film theory or film criticism, although I see a lot of films and I've read books about film criticism and film theory. I just don't want to pretend to be an expert, but 
I do see filmmakers as potentially very important allies because as with other creative artists such as poets and novelists and playwrights what a filmmaker ultimately creates is a world um, the world of the story they're telling the world of their cinematic text you might say um, there's or it may be yeah it's there is a world that's that's being created or at least scenes of a world and in a sense a film is like a parable you're saying life is like <laughs> yeah. and if you're making a Forrest Gump film it's like a box of chocolates um, but but life is like these scenes and that's a proposition I mean it there's there's a truth claim that's being made I think in serious films life is like this or think of life like this with as in terms of this story in terms of this scene and I think that in our society that is starved for meaning, not to mention visions of goodness and beauty, what filmmakers have to offer is like a cup of cold water to people lost in the desert. Mm. The philosopher Charles Taylor says we're, that the secular age is one that has been in which the world has been disenchanted. And he actually says that the reason it's been disenchanted is not because someone has proved that there's no God or that, that human beings are only material, but rather those ideas have just become part of the fabric of what he calls the social imaginary. Mm. These taken for granted truths that have just become part of our culture. Nobody's argued for them. We just assume them and pass them on now. And so uh, for many people, Christianity has become implausible. That is, it has, it's just not believable. That's and, and I think one of the best things a Christian filmmaker can do is chip away at these plausibility structures and just keep on presenting the world in such a way that it does make sense all on the grounds of the Christian story about Jesus Christ. You, you have the ability through creating these worlds and these stories to affect what people feel to be plausible. You, you also, I'm just trying to find this in, in your book. I just, just read it recently. Um, oh yeah, to associate God's word with light is to contrast it with the dark counsels of a fallen world. In Calvin's word, unless the word of God enlightened men's path, the whole, the whole of their life is enveloped in darkness and obscurity yes. so that they cannot do anything else other than miserably wander from the right way. And uh, you go on to explain how um, God's light is challenging the darkness. And, you know, that, that's one of the elements of, of, of the metaphor and imagination that we can be using to challenge those structures, like you said, mm -hmm. that we just embrace and accept. Yeah. Um, and we can provide the alternative. Um, yeah. That could be meaningful to audiences. And, and you know, darkness is, is a, the operative concept these days because in many films, particularly those for younger people, uh, the, the world is dystopian, right? It's not, a, it's not a good place, it's a bad place. And I think there is a kind of eschatology, a doctrine of last things that's circulating in our culture. It's in part fueled by concerns about the planet and ecology but it's also I think a function of the fact that you know we don't believe there's a God out there who's looking after us anymore that you know the notion of God's providence seems to have been forgotten and so dystopian fiction means it is actually dark for people <laughs> uh, for as far as novelists go uh, recently, I've read a trilogy by Kent Haruf, H-A-R-U-F. It's uh, actions, lovely stories set in a small town in Colorado. And what's striking about it is um, the characters are ordinary. It isn't like Tolkien or Lewis where there are magical things going on. The characters are ordinary, but they're decent, uh, mm -hmm. more than decent they're good, and more than good, they're loving. They're ordinary people who do exceptional things in this small town. And again, 
That's, that's the essence of parable, right? The, the parables that Jesus told were always about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Ah, interesting. Yeah, right. and I think, I think, again, I would encourage filmmakers to think in those terms. You know, don't worry about not having a budget for special effects or CGI or whatever it is. Yeah. Just, yeah, just tell good stories about ordinary people that do extraordinary right. things. The most important thing would be this. Try to tell stories that help make the Christian worldview more plausible um, by telling stories about ordinary people whose lives give evidence of the life of Christ in them or, or grace. Um, I, I think, yeah, just yeah. chip away at the plausibility structure. Show that, you know, it's possible for... Uh, a man and a woman to remain married despite <laughs> the yes. fact that they argue, you know, or show faithfulness in, in action and and forgiveness. Um, I think, yeah, and then just as the Apostle Paul says that we take every thought captive right. to the obedience of Christ, I would I would encourage Christian filmmakers to try to take the social imaginary captive to the obedience of Christ. Because the social imaginary that prevails in our contemporary culture um, is, uh, you know, tells a different story. It's, it represents another gospel. The, the gospel, for example, that if we could only have all our desires met, we would be happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's what That's our right. culture... And, but this is a false gospel. Um, yeah. So you've got to chip away at that the big social imaginary. Not and that that would be my my biggest exhortation, I yeah. guess. Uh, think of yourselves as foreign and indie filmmakers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think I that agree. I think that fits the gospel much better than we're a studio project. That's a very interesting conclusion that Dr. Van Hooser left us with. To think of ourselves as indie filmmakers. Now, I've thought a lot about that and what indie filmmaking means. The Hollywood studio system tends to demand stories be high concept too often at the expense of personal films or films that don't fit easily into the marketing machine. Particularly in the faith-based arena, there has to be some caution for any studio to follow a known success, whether it's a faith or secular film success. And it's often the rogue or indie filmmakers who have to blaze new ground. Hollywood is a profit machine that doesn't like risk, so the pressure to model known successes is overpowering. So I think if we are to implement Dr. Van Hooser's admonitions, it will have to be born out of an indie film mindset, not a studio film mindset. And now we have Dr. Jonathan Lehman, who begins by telling us what he likes about Christian film, both the good and the bad. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's a mix. Right there, there's good things and there's bad things. Things I like, things I don't like. Um, I l l let me start with what I like. Sure. What what I like is that Christian movies, the good ones and the bad ones, frankly, all of them on the whole, provide a right. It sound a little academic for for a second. A right moral ecology. Uh, that that is to say, uh, they present a world in which the hero is not the self-defining, self-expressing individual. You look at Western movies in the last 23 years, who is the hero? The hero is always the person who stands up for himself, right? Whether we're talking about Dead Poets yeah. Society or Jason Bourne or whatever it is, the hero is the self-defining, self-expressing individual. That is the ethic of the day. Whereas Christian movies, they have this strange habit, like the Bible, of... The hero being the person who submits, the person who is broken, the person who, mm. who repents and finally kind of gets to the end of themselves. And that's true whether we're talking about like an old classic like The Mission or, you know, something new like Facing the Giants or Fireproof or, you know, whatever it is, Samson. Uh, the hero in Christian movies, and again, I think this is from Scripture, is the person who repents, the person who is broken, the person who reaches the end of themselves. 
I get, I get that from Tim Keller. He talks about moral ecology being made up of, you know, your rules of right and wrong, but it's also who your heroes are. And it, it's, it's, it's a society's heroes that are going to define for the next generation what we aspire to be. Right. You know, how did Martin Luther King become Martin Luther King? He, did, he didn't do it just because he was in Sunday school classes learning lessons of right and wrong. He, he, he lived in a neighborhood and in a community that had certain kind of heroes, right? And, uh, well, who are the heroes in, in, in America today or in the West today? Well, yeah. again, it's the person who stands up for himself. Whereas in the scripture, the hero is King David when he submits, yeah. right? as opposed to King Saul, who asserts his own way. Hmm. And in Christian movies, what makes, and again, this is the good movies and the bad movies. There's just this instinct that Christian film producers have, like Christian novelists, this instinct we all have to, that the hero is the person who reaches the end of themselves. Yeah. And finally submits and says, yes, okay, Lord, or whatever it is. You know, I think we, people, people like to make fun of sometimes Christian movies and the quality of production and stuff like that. And, and, uh, you know, they, sometimes they seem a little cheesy. I, I honestly don't mind that hmm. because when my, my, my kids are watching so recently, I had them watch, you can only imagine Yeah, both, whatever his name is, the lead singer of, of mercy me, Bart something. And his dad, the two characters in that, they accomplish something. They find redemption when they submit, right. when they repent, when they break. And so I want my kids watching that. Absolutely. I need that. You know, I need that. Yeah. So oh. that's the big thing going, I think, for, for, for Christian film. Okay. How about uh, the negative? Any, any criticisms in general that you could... Well, again, Todd, you asked me to think kind of theologically. So I'm, I'm thinking big picture here, right? So So... I gave you sort of the big picture theological, what I like about the hero is the person who, who repents. The, the critique I would offer of many Christian film, films, this is not all of them, but many of them, is there's a kind of prosperity gospel latent within them. Yeah. Which is to say, when you repent, you'll get, you'll get everything. that you Right. Know, you'll get health, wealth, happiness. So, I mean, a, a classic example would be facing the giants, right? Did, did you ever see that one? Yes, I did. Well, I enjoyed it. It's a it's a fun movie. But sure enough, when 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 the coach finally, as it were, breaks and and puts his trust in the Lord, what happens then? Well, then, lo and behold, the, the team wins everything. And if you read the Bible, you know that's just not true. You know that in this world, sometimes we are going to lose. Your your wife is going to get cancer and die, and you will go bankrupt and people will persecute you and things don't always go well in this world. Our, world. our hope is in the next world finally, right? And so that that's a risk. I, and this isn't, this isn't a problem just for Christian movie makers. I think this is a problem for Christian novelists as well. How do you, how do you tell a story that compels people to move forward? Because people want the happy ending, but the Christian message doesn't in this world always promise a happy ending. And, and so that's something I think Christian movie makers and, again, storytellers in general need to be very cautious about, uh, that the hope, the, hope, the hope we have is in Christ, uh, not in winning the Super Bowl, getting the girl, making a lot of money, making the business deal, whatever it is. Uh, so, the, yeah, the idea there being Christianity becomes a means to some worldly end. That, that's when you know you're in a prosperity gospel, a health, wealth gospel. There are Christian movies that don't have the happy ending. Yeah. I mean, I think of thing. I don't know if you remember the older movie, The Mission, which was one of my favorites back in right. know, when that came out, eighties, nineties, where at the end, uh, Robert De Niro dies, and the tribe is destroyed, and it's it's a tragic yeah. ending. On the one hand, on the other hand, you you see the 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 conflict, and some of the philosophical dilemmas that Christianity will will present. Yeah. Um, or you think of a movie, and I don't know if this would count as a quote unquote Christian movie. I think of a movie like Amadeus, right? What do you Yeah, what do you okay. See? Again, you, yeah. You, you, see, you see the tragedy of covetousness. Yeah. Or even thinking of something like Anna Karenina, whether, whether in the novel or the movie form, what, what do you have? You see that both a woman and her husband utterly enslaved to their sin. And I think that that's a good message to learn. Yeah, right? for sure. So I, I, think, I think the quote unquote you know, we can have another conversation as to what counts as a Christian movie, but I think I don't think you have to have the prosperity gospel ending or the everything works out happy ending in order for there to be a redemptive message. You know, I I, I interviewed uh, 
Kevin Van Hooser, and you know, one of his th- things is theological uh, yeah. theodrama, oh, you know, right. taking theology and putting it into dramatic yeah. form to help the church. His idea was to help the church embody that, you know, because we ought to be putting theology on display mm-hmm. in our lives. And I took that and said, you know, we ought to be embodying theology and putting that on display in yeah. our movies. And uh, that, that's what sort of where well, I'm let me, let, me, let me take you into my world just to make an analogy for a second. I, I write books and I help others write books working for a ministry called Nine Marks. And uh, most of the books we write are for church leaders. They are uh, theological. They tend to be fairly didactic. Like, you know, here's a Bible passage. Let me tell you how this applies to your church, right? And what, what occurs to me, though, the reason I love reading novels, and love watching new movies, is precisely for the reasons you're saying, that that narrative is powerful. A few years ago, in fact, I, I read the book, this was about a decade, 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, uh, Blue Like Jazz, you remember that? Did you ever read that one? Yes, yeah. Okay, well, what, whatever you think of Donald Miller's worldview, and I'm, I'm not a big Donald Miller fan, it, it was a powerful book. He communicated a worldview, he communicated a vision, he communicated, again, the phrase moral ecology by telling a story, a very transparent, open, interesting story. And it occurred to me, okay, what my own ministry needs is, is, is a book uh, that accomplishes the same thing, that tells a story, that communicates a worldview in a powerful way, but with, I, I hope, better theology, right? Um I've, I've told my colleagues, we, we need our nine marks blue like jazz. That's what we're looking for. Ah, that's an interesting point. Uh, but that's what, you're exactly right, Todd. Uh, I think Christians should be able to and learn how to, look, I'm a theology guy, but I still want Christians to do a better job of tapping into the power of narrative and cinema specifically because it communicates a worldview. It develops a moral ecology. Here's the dilemma, Tim, this lecture I heard, kind of a private lecture thing with Tim Keller. He made the point, why is it that, you know, our kids are growing up in Sunday school class and they learn all the lessons about biblical morality, but then they go off to college and immediately abandon it, immediately drop it. Well, that's because they've been imbibing a cultural worldview and everything from uh, Beauty and the Beast to uh, uh, Frozen to, you know, again, the various popular movies of the day in which the hero is the self-defining, self-exalting individual. That's right. right? That's, that's, that's the hero in our kids' minds. So when they get to college and they're surrounded by, or out into the world, and they're surrounded by people saying this non-biblical morality uh, all of that inside of them sort of kicks in and it just makes sense. Like, well, isn't loving people, letting them be who they're supposed to be? Dad? Right. That's right. And I, I think, uh, I think Christian movies, Christian novels, Christian art in general, but let's, let's focus on movies right now. I think are a powerful, potentially extremely helpful way for developing a, um, a, a right and biblical moral ecology. Kevin Van Hooser said that Christian filmmakers can be allies to the church. Would you say the same thing? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I would, I would, I would think exactly that. Um, well, think about Ephesians four. He's given us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and building up of the body of Christ. Okay, so you got pastors preaching the Bible. Who are they preaching the Bible to? Well, to plumbers, teachers, electricians, lawyers, doctors, and writers and filmmakers, right? Mm, yeah. And those writers and filmmakers uh, should uh, be asking themselves, okay, how can I work as under Christ in this particular medium? Now, that might be making quote-unquote Christian film, Christian stories. It might be doing something that's not explicitly Christian as such, but is clearly reinforcing and promoting a kind of... uh, biblical or Christian worldview or perspective in some form or fashion, both for the sake of the saints, for the sake of the church, but also for the sake of the world, right? In different, mm-hmm. in different ways. So yeah. in that sense, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think Christian movie producers should be allies, as you put it. 
one of the powerful things that you can do is pre present a picture of the life that comes when we submit to God or God's law or we, we, we come to the end of ourselves and we, we repent of our sins. There's lots of ways of demonstrating that. Or, or you present the person who doesn't. And they just fall deeper and deeper into tragedy. And again, I think of Anna Karenina being a, a good illustration of that. How do, how should Christian filmmakers view uh, the passage in, in Timothy where there's qualifications for those who are preaching and teaching, being a sound doctrine, rightly handling the word of truth? How would you apply that to Christian filmmakers? Well, I think a Christian filmmaker should be careful never to teach anything untrue. Now, obviously, Paul uh, Paul there is addressing Timothy in, in light of the church's ministry and pastoral responsibility. So its first application mm -hmm. is, is to teachers, elders, pastors, and churches. Nonetheless, it clearly applies to all of us that w whatever our industry is, whatever work we're doing, is, is we want to represent truth rightly and scripture rightly. Right. And, and uh, being sloppy, being careless, uh, with scripture, it's it's like it's like you take a gun and angle it three degrees off. Well, a few you know few feet out of the barrel, that three degrees doesn't make much of a difference. But let that bullet travel for you know a mile, and that three degree difference is 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 pretty pretty significant in where it should have been, right? I think that. Uh, Scripture mishandled is like that. Uh, we can be lazy. Well, I know the text kind of means this, but let me, you know, let me, let me put it this way. Well, then it's your wisdom. It's not God's wisdom. And it's right. God's wisdom that gives life, that causes uh, blind eyes to see, deaf ears to hear, uh, dead bodies to rise up. It's God's wisdom, not my wisdom, not your wisdom. So that's why we need to rightly handle the word of truth. <laughs> That's it for the highlights of The Theologians. I hope this has been encouraging and edifying. You'll find more information about our guests and links to their ministries and books in the show notes of this episode on our website. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. If you wish to support my work here and keep these podcasts going, you'll find information about how you can do that on the website at ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life echoes in eternity. <laughs> <laughs>